Welcome to another session of Lectures by Lobezy. I'm your host, Dr. Lobezy. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the period 1870-1914, uh, specifically with regards to governments. Okay, uh, so talk a lot about nation states, national unity, political parties. Um, we're going to talk about France. Uh, and Great Britain and uh, Germany quite a bit, uh, how they wrestle with uh, democracy, socialism, and nationalism. So uh, a lot of important topics uh, to discuss. Uh, okay, so one of the most Im important things to note is that like starting in 1870 and moving forward into, I don't know, 20th century, we start to see all across Europe more and more um, people, men specifically first, being granted the right to vote, okay? So eventually we're going to get to the point of universal male suffrage. And then after World War I, uh, you're going to start to see universal suffrage where women were granted the right to vote. But what we're starting to see is mass participation in politics, okay? And that's going to have a huge change, okay? You may recall the beginning of the year, we talked about there were three different entities that sort of fought for control, political power. There was the church, uh, there was the monarchy, and then the nobility, okay? And then after the French Revolution, uh, throughout Europe, we see those three groups working together. And shortly thereafter, uh, well, about a, it takes about 100, another 100 years, but we start to see mass participation in politics, okay, i.e. universal male suffrage. And so it, it radically alters the landscape of politics. And what we're going to start to see is the emergence of uh, modern political parties. And basically, they're all going to have their constituents, and they're going to try to meet the needs of their constituents. All right, and so we're going to talk about uh, some of those things. But one of the things that um, governments wanted to do was... Um, create unity within their country, all right? And uh, so they, they had to kind of do this balancing act between all of the different uh, wishes of the different constituencies, but at the same time trying to maintain uh, unity within the country, all right? We start to see people really begin um, to sort of like their governments they because they're more representative. Uh, they, they start to be more responsive to their needs. And, and um, as a result of that, we see people experiencing heightened uh, feelings of patriotism or love of country, okay? Um, but there, there's still going to be those people who were typically or traditionally in charge, those that are known as the conservatives. And they're going to they're gonna do their best to hold on to power against these new uh, factions. Um, one group will be considered liberals. Uh, the traditional or classical liberal. And then we're going to see another group known as the socialists. And so the conservatives are, are, are going to do their very best to try to um, kind of direct people away from these new political parties, but especially the socialist parties because of, um, because of sort of the, the, the radical message uh, that they carry. All right. Uh, we're also going to look at um, how foreign policy is sometimes used to sort of direct um, people's patriotism towards their country and sort of um, convince the, you know, sort of distract the population um, so that they don't see other issues that might be more pressing. But um, we're not going to talk about that too much here. All right, so <clears throat> starting with Germany, uh, they become a, you know, the, the, a unified country in 1871 after the Franco-Prussian War. Uh, remember Otto von Bismarck led the way. Uh, he, he saw to it that Kaiser Wilhelm I is, uh, is crowned the, the king or the emperor of, of Germany. All right, in the French um, Palace of Versailles, the Hall of uh, Mirrors, no less. Okay, that victory over the French in the Franco-Prussian War symbolizes that Germany is the most powerful uh, country in continental Europe, all right? Um, the argument could be made that they were more powerful than Great Britain, but remember Great Britain isn't um, necessarily part of the continent, 
so to speak. I mean, I mean, they are the European, but again, they're not uh, connected because they're an island nation. But anyway, they are uh, without a doubt the most powerful country in continental Europe. Okay, um, <clears throat> but they do rival. Uh, they do rival um, Great Britain uh, as far as shipping goes. They rival Great Britain as far as industrialization goes and the amount of natural resources so they're they're if if they're not the most powerful if they're not more powerful than great britain they're certainly on their heels um one of the things that is noteworthy is that uh germany adopted a federal system just like the united states uh, where uh you know the united states has 50 states and there's this idea of federalism where the the federal government shares power with the state governments that same sort of uh setup was adopted in um in germany okay uh and by the end of the 19th century they are a growing population uh, so it looks by 1914 they have a population of 67 million so uh the german middle class really uh, did well during this time period and education was something that was very important uh to the german people and they sort of prided themselves on being responsible and sort of patriotic or loyal, I guess. Um, the term is deference to authority in the, right here, deference to authority. So that was something that was sort of noteworthy. All right. Um, anyway, there's handsome devil, Otto von Bismarck. Um, so he was the chancellor of Prussia and he becomes the chancellor of Germany. Um, and remember, he, he utilized uh, realpolitik as a foreign policy strategy to bring about unification of Germany. And he's going to kind of utilize that same policy for domestic um, uh, purposes. Okay. And, and, and the end result or the goal, the end goal is to become as powerful as, po uh, as po possible, the, make the government as powerful as possible. All right. So one little note um, as far as foreign policy goes, because they had taken Alsace and Lorraine from France, he, uh, Bismarck realizes that France is always going to be its enemy and they're going to want revenge or revenge. Um, but the, one of the ways to prevent France from seeking revenge was to isolate her. And that means make sure uh, France doesn't have any allies. And so they were able to do that by building, uh, or he was able to establish an alliance system with Austria, uh, who they had defeated uh, in the uh, Austro-Prussian War, uh, but then also Russia, okay, and that is going to be known as the Three Emperors Club. You don't need to know that at this time, but that's what that is. All right, so on the domestic front, um, he he tries to uh, weaken uh, the Catholic Church inside of Germany as as well as the socialists, and the reason being is because he feels that they are competition and that they threaten unity. Uh, within Germany. And so he's going to uh, try to uh, successfully, you know, defeat or, or, or sort of marginalize those two different group, those two groups. Okay. And so his, his battle with the uh, Catholic church is known as culture conf or culture struggle. Um, he himself, Bismarck is a Protestant and uh, probably two thirds of the country is Protestant. Uh, but if you look at southern Germany, like Bavaria and other parts, uh, Black Forest, Württemberg, things like that, uh, are Catholic. So about one third of the country's um, German population is Catholic. And he he distrusted uh, the Catholic citizen because he felt that their loyalty to the state would be second to that of the Pope. All right. And so he was uh, suspicious. And so he tried to sort of weaken them. Uh, and and this is a battle uh, sort of symbolized here, a chess match um, between Otto von Bismarck and uh, Pope Pius uh, IX. So it's interesting to note there was something called the Papal Infallibility um, of 1870, which uh, was discussed in a previous lecture, but again, it just discussed, it, 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 it points out that the, the Pope um, is infallible when it comes to um, dogmatic um, um, subjects. Okay, so infallible mean incapable of being wrong uh, when it comes to uh, things that deal with the religion. All right. Now that has sort of always been kind of understood as the case uh, throughout the course, 
this course, but um, that was something that was stipulated uh, in the in that papal bull. All right, uh, infallibility, and I think uh, if memory serves me correct, they only utilized it uh, once since that time when uh, they talked about uh, the Virgin Mother, um, what happened to her when she died. Uh, and that is that she was, uh, the Catholic Church teaches that she was assumed uh, into heaven, uh, much in the, the, much the way that uh, Jesus uh, of Nazareth was believed to have been assumed as well. Uh, okay, so anyway, he supervised or supports laws that uh, attempt to weaken uh, the Catholic Church's hold on education um, because, you know, whoever has control of education can, has tremendous influence over the youth and, you know, some indoctrination to, can take place there. So he wants to weaken the hold that the Catholic Church has on uh, education and replace it with a more, you know, state-controlled secular form of education. Um, he also tries to... Uh, uh, kick uh, all the Jesuits out of uh, Germany and makes it passes a law that says that you must be married by civil authorities that it, uh, just being married by a priest is not um, uh, enough and so these um, measures sort of backfired all right and so there was a political party known as the center party that defended the Catholics and the reason why they did that was they were they were looking for supporters to sort of oppose Bismarck's more conservative party. At any rate, um, he 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 backpedals a little bit. He he attempts to um, appeal to the Catholic farmers uh, in in Germany by uh, placing high tariffs on foreign grains and things like that. So. It, it ends up being sort of um, a wash, if you will. Uh, neither side wins, but he certainly didn't have the same kind of <clears throat> um, su success domestically that he did um, in, you know, in the process of German unification. The other group that he takes on is the uh, the Socialist Party, uh, known as the German Social Democratic Party or SPD. Uh, and and so the reason being is because they they talk about. Um, you know, as followers of Marx, they would be in favor of, uh, you know, overthrowing the government and um, getting rid of uh, private property and this just major over overhaul of uh, society. And so he is able to ram through the Reichstag, which is the lower house of, we'll just call it the German legislature. Uh, they were able to ram through some anti-socialist laws, um, but as a re despite them having to sort of go underground, um, socialism and the idea of socialism uh, remains popular uh, because of the desire. See, the Germans are a little bit different. Uh, some people would uh, oppose um, too much governmental control like the British. They don't like too much governmental control over them, um, just like the Americans as well. But uh, the Germans are a little bit different. They're sort of traditionally used to a very authoritarian governmental style. Uh, and what socialism purports to do is sort of take care of people's needs. Um, so they're a little subservient in that way. But anyway, um, the, one of the things that Bismarck attempted to do was sort of steal the thunder of the socialists. And what that means is um, if he sort of co-ops their um, you know issues that they care about and make them his own well then people wouldn't have any reason to uh, support socialists right so what he's able to do is and some people accused him of what was called state socialism but he is instrumental in um, creating a social welfare system in the state of Germany, okay? And it's going to be one that is copied uh, by the rest of Europe. So this is significant, all right? So uh, a, a number of social welfare programs, including health, accident and disability insurance, as well as old age uh, pension, which, you know, in the United States, we would refer to that as social security benefits. So 
they're the first country to do that. And as I said, other countries are going to follow suit. Um, but despite doing that, socialism remains popular. I'm not really sure why. That's sort of a mystery. I'd have to dig a little deeper, but we'll just kind of take it at face value. All right. Um, so when Kaiser Wilhelm I dies, his son comes to the throne, and his name is Kaiser Wilhelm II. And he is, uh, there's a lot of um, biographical information about him um, that is not very favorable um, because he, he is sort of seen as a, a person who is really more so than anybody else in Europe. Um, the most responsible for plunging uh, Germany and the rest of the world, for that matter, into World War I. Um, so he, he's not the most stable leader, um, sort of uh, impetuous and um, defensive and uh, hot-headed and thin-skinned, and there's a lot of different adjectives that could be used to describe him. Um, and he, he sort of had a, a fragile ego as well. And he did not like Otto von Bismarck in part because of how popular he was. Uh, he was sort of like a legend. And so he didn't want to mm, share the stage so to speak, with Bismarck, so he forces him uh, to resign in 1890. Um, so a lot of things go go downhill um, for, on a foreign policy standpoint, which is dealt with, you know, with the, the lead up to World War I. Um, a lot of the, you know, as I mentioned earlier, they had, uh, Bismarck had sought to isolate France, and he was very successful at doing that. Uh, by creating alliances with Russia, most importantly, and Austria. Uh, so when Kaiser Wilhelm II comes along, he he uh, he sort of screws all that stuff up, all right? And uh, by 1914, Germany is the country that is isolated, uh, no longer France. So, um, but we're we're really not going to talk too much about Kaiser Wilhelm here. Only that uh, he he legalizes um, the socialist political party. And as a result, they're able to begin getting elected uh, to the Reichstag, again, which is the lower house of the uh, German legislative body. Uh, and then by 1912, they become the single largest political party in all of Germany. All right. But you might think, well, why didn't they have a revolution then? And, you know, if that's what socialists want, um, that's a good question. But the answer has to do with, uh, the German Socialist Party, party sort of evolves, okay, and um, loses some of its radical, revolutionary sort of flavor, if you will, all right? Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later uh, as well. But if we look at France, um, th th they had some problems on their hand. Remember, um, they had Napoleon III uh, as their emperor. And uh, he, you know, uh, unfortunately blundered when he uh, sort of took the bait and declared war on Prussia uh, because the Franco-Prussian War did not go well uh, for him personally. He was captured and then France uh, was defeated and humiliated because uh, Paris was surrounded and laid siege to. And so it was just a bad situation. Uh, so after um, his defeat and forced abdication, um, the, the Germans under Bismarck wanted them to, you know, form a new government that would not be, you know, a monarchy or, you know, an, an empire led by somebody like Napoleon. They were kind of looking towards them to be some, you know, like become a republic, which they had been previously, uh, on two occasions. Um, but the, the, the French people rejected that, um, because they thought a Republican form of government would be uh, sort of chaotic. And uh, even though Napoleon III was flawed uh, because he, um, you know, got France involved in some, you know, humiliating uh, or 
made some blunders on the foreign policy stage. He was he 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 provided order and stability. And if you look, you know, at France's history with the French Revolution and the revolutions of 1830, the revolutions of 1848, I mean, the people have a reason to want somebody that would provide stability. And so for them, the the public wasn't really sold on the idea of a republic. The that that just created too many opportunities for um, unrest. Okay, so um, they they sort of were in, interested in creating a, a new monarchy, um, but the people like socialists within Paris, um, ref, you know, refused to go along with that, and uh, they essentially established a new government, kind of like seceding. Uh, from the rest of France, and it was known as the Paris Commune. Uh, so you would have, if they were successful, uh, to, you know, a country within France. Okay, that would sort of be like, you know, Vatican City inside of Italy. It's a separate country. Um, but, you know, the the rest of France claimed Paris as their capital as well, so they're not going to, you know, just turn it over to these uh, radicals. And so, uh, again, there's an uprising. All right, and there's a bloody fight, just like we saw in the you know the revolutions of 1830 and 1848. People take to the streets, but um, it was put down um, pretty pretty uh, harshly, and uh, uh, those people who were involved were either executed or sent off to uh, penal colonies. Many of them in uh, like South America. Um, Okay, so out of this, um, they adopt a new form of government, which ends up being a republic. So, you know, it's just a, uh, the Paris Commune is sort of a hiccup uh, on the way to them becoming the Third Republic, which is what they still are uh, today. So they establish a new government. Um, they have a presidency and political parties, etc. All right. Um, wait a minute. There we go. Um, so th their legislative body known as the Le National Assembly, which you may recall was, you know, the, what the legislation, uh, le legislative body was called right at the beginning of the French Revolution. But anyway, Adolf Thiers is their first president and, um, you know, sort of promises a, uh, socially conservative, uh, platform that he's going to rule, uh, from sort of similar to that of, um. Napoleon III. And again, that conservative um, governing nature is is desired um, because it, it promises stability and order. Okay, so that's what the people wanted. Anyway, um, what are some of the things they do? Compulsory education for boys and girls. Um, and that's important because that really helps um, inculcate some some ideas uh, in the youth, you know, like shared values and things like that. So if you want people to sort of be assimilated to, uh, you know, a specific culture, you can use education for that. And, and you know, the word uh, indoctrination, uh, brainwashing is maybe a little too harsh in the way you would describe that. But that's sort of what happens with, with students and, you know, through education. So you can help create a unified um, state teach the importance of patriotism, you know, love of country, service to one's country. That that goes a long way in creating stability uh, over the long haul. Uh, if people uh, are taught to love their country and to serve their country and to sort of think of their country as greater than themselves, um, then they're going to be less apt to rebel. All right, and that's useful. Uh, Rebellion isn't always a good thing. I mean, there's some instances where it might be necessary, but um, I think France doesn't want any more because they've just dealt with so much. All right, so there's this little issue here, and it's a sort of a side issue. It's called the Dreyfus Affair. Uh, it's not a major event, but it, it does serve to divide the country. Um, and it's going to have some interesting uh, ramifications. Okay, so there is this uh, Jewish captain in the French military who was accused and convicted of treason. And uh, his family, um, you know, believed that he was innocent and he was sort of framed um, because of anti-Semitism within the military. 
and uh, they were able to appeal to um, the public through newspapers that you know their their Alfred was uh, was innocent of the charges, and then he had you know um, been sort of framed. Uh, they were able to uh, get the support of very famous French uh, novelist uh, Emile Zola, and um, eventually they were able to get him cleared of the charges. But what it did is divided the country. So you had the army, uh, people who would consider themselves uh, anti-Semites, hate, you know, haters of Jews, and then also the Catholic Church. Not really sure why the Catholic Church viewed him as guilty. Maybe, maybe there were elements of anti-Semitism within the Catholic Church at that time. I'm not too sure, but then there was sort of everybody else. And it was, it was one of those sort of cultural events that kind of divides the country. So if you take, for example, what's going on currently in the United States with, or in the world, you know, with the uh, coronavirus pandemic, uh, one of the things that I've noticed, and maybe you have too, is how the country is divided. Um, some people believe uh, that the uh, country should remain locked down, uh, that this is a terrible virus and that we must do everything that we uh, can to protect ourselves and our loved ones, and that uh, as long as the doctors uh, and, and scientists tell us to stay locked down, then we should stay locked down. And anyone who goes out ventures out as a fool and they're, you know, endangering others uh, unnecessarily. Okay, so that's one group. And then on the other side, there's another group who tend to think that, um, you know, although the virus is, is bad, um, it may not be as bad as everybody sort of thinks and that it might be, you know, the effects of it might be exaggerated, and that the dangers that the uh, uh, virus sort of present or represents is only really toward, it's most dangerous towards the, the old or the people who are, you know, already sort of sick, uh, already medically compromised, and that the vast majority of people are sort of safe from it so why not allow them to go out go out to eat at restaurants and uh, be able to go out without wearing masks and and most importantly return to work and and their biggest criticism is that this virus is not as dangerous as it, it was thought that initially that it was going to be and that it it's not worth destroying our economy and risking a, a depression. So it's interesting because if you follow the stuff in the news and on social media, you can really get a feel for how this issue has divided the country. And interestingly enough, it's sort of divided itself along political lines. So Democrats tend to think that the country should remain locked down and Republicans tend to think that the government uh, excuse me, that uh, that the economy should be opened up. So it, I would, you know, say that this Dreyfus affair was one of those issues uh, that divide, it was, a, you know, they this was where they had their, their fight over issues. And so one side of the country thought one way and the other side, of the, you know, the other part of the country felt another way. But anyway, it does have some ramifications because when it's all said and done when the dust settles with the Dreyfus affair the Catholic Church is sort of removed um, from education uh, now you can still pay if you want to attend you know Catholic schools and stuff like that but there's no governmental support for it so all education in France becomes secular after that okay so at any rate so that's France so let's take a look at Great uh, Britain and so this is a uh, photograph of Queen Victoria. And so um, she was uh, the longest serving uh, monarchy in, in all of uh, definitely British history or English history. I'm trying to think Louis XIV. His reign was 70 some odd years long. So maybe not as long. But then uh, Queen Elizabeth II, the current monarch of England, I think she's uh, 
she's the longest serving now. But at any, at any rate, um, her her reign is associated with the it's called the Victorian era or the Victorian age, and it sort of symbolizes a couple of things. It symbolizes Great Britain sort of being elevated to the most powerful country in in Europe uh, or one of the leading you know world powers, um, and and whether or not it was you know militarily more powerful than you know uh, germany which i kind of mentioned earlier isn't the point it's it's that they're wealthy uh and that they have reach and the reason why they have reach all around the world is because of their very large navy and they have at this point in time well by the end of her reign great britain will have the largest empire the world has ever seen okay if you look at canada you look at all the parts of um, africa and australia and India, I mean, it's it, it, it it's uh, very large, uh, to say the least. So the other thing, though, that is symbolic of the Victorian age is the, um, the, the value system. So today we would consider it sort of stuffy, uh, this idea that you, you had to be sort of in charge, in, in control of your emotions. Um, everything you did needed to be seen as respectable. Um, nothing sort of, uh, flamboyant or over the top. Um, and, and not only that, that you, you had an expectation to be a hard worker, um, be honest, um, and, you know, be patriotic to your country. And so she sort of embodied those, those kind of, uh, values or virtues. So Anyway, yeah, so here's that map that I was kind of, so here's Canada, here's Australia, India, and then this is their uh, empire in Africa. So the, there is an old saying that the sun never sets on the British Empire. Uh, it's got some literal and some figurative uh, meaning there. But anyway, um, Queen Victoria sort of uh, ruled over, and, and she didn't have uh, legitimate, you know, uh, real power i mean it, it, by this point in time um the power had sort of transferred hands into the parliament um, but she certainly helped um influence things and during this time period she believed that uh during her reign that england or great britain should become more inclusive as far as its uh political uh, scene was concerned, meaning that she believed that more people should be involved, involved in the uh, political process. And so that's where we uh, kind of jump to. All right. Uh, but before we do, we want to talk about the importance of um, the media um, or you know, print media, newspapers in particular, um, and the role that education served. And so these are sort of, you know, uh, overlap because Obviously, if people aren't well educated, they can't read. Uh, and when people can become more educated, they want news and they want um, you know uh, to know what's going on. And so newspapers um, sort of fill the void and provide people what they want. And so to appeal to the masses, newspapers have to uh, uh, appeal to the the lowest educated of them all all right and so the the types of things that they write about aren't exactly highbrow um and and again that's not all newspapers but the vast majority of them because they're trying to appeal to people who may not be um super literate uh, but anyway um but the point is that newspapers become very important in helping shape and mold public opinion and the media today, obviously, uh, is, as far as that is concerned, uh, still very uh, powerful in that way. Um, okay. And then the other thing, too, is that politicians become a little bit more savvy and um, responsive to the needs of people. And this is where probably politicians begin to get a, a bad reputation, this idea that they're crooked or that they're not trustworthy. And if you you know, aren't cynical for a moment and you understand it's difficult being a politician because you have so many different groups of people who want different things. And so if you want a, uh, a long career in politics, you've, you've, you've got to be able to develop a way to listen to all of 
the different groups. And sometimes those groups might have opposing ideas. And so you have to sort of straddle both sides of the fence. And so sometimes, you know, politicians take it a little too far and they'll, you know, tell one group one thing and then go to the other group when they're campaigning and tell them something completely opposite. And so then obviously they get the reputation of not being trustworthy. They, you know, you don't know where they stand on things, but that's, that's the nature of uh, modern politics. Okay. So just as um, Otto von Bismarck tried to steal the thunder of the socialists by implementing all of these uh, generous social or not generous necessarily, but social uh, welfare programs, so too do the conservatives in Great Britain try to do the same thing. Okay, so they pass a new measure known as, known as the Second Reform Bill, which uh, expands the voting uh, block a little bit larger, getting closer and closer to universal male suffrage. So that's 1867. It's led by the conservatives, and this man, his name is uh, Benjamin Disraeli, uh, and so he served as prime minister uh, during this time. And then there was an election in the following year, 1868, where, uh, the, uh, liberals, uh, took control of parliament and as such appointed a new parliament, uh, or, uh, prime minister. Okay. So this term down here is important. It's called parliamentary, uh, democracy. So the way the elections work in Great Britain and the way that they appoint their prime minister is com is different than what it happens in the United States. So we have elections every four years. Well, we actually have elections every two years to elect all the uh, House of Representatives and one third of all the senators. But the way it works in the United States, we can elect, you know, like, okay, we have a Republican president with Donald Trump right now in 2020. Um, but we also have a democratically controlled House of Representatives. Nancy Pelosi is the, she is the Speaker of the House and she have, she's a Democrat. But then if we go over to the Senate, um, that is controlled by uh, the, the Republicans. Uh, Senator from Kentucky, um, Bill, no, that's not right, oh boy. It'll come to me. At any rate, um, it's divided. So our government is divided. The way it works in Great Britain is once the liberals, like all the people go to the poll, to the polls uh, and they vote, they cast their votes. Do they want the conservatives or do they want the liberals? And so whoever gets more votes gets control of um, the prime becomes, you know, the, the, they're, they get to appoint someone to be the prime minister. All right. And it's somebody who's within parliament gets plucked out and then they become the prime minister. So hopefully that makes sense. But that's something unique about the way they do things. Um, so what we start to see then happening, because the conservatives don't want to be locked out, they start uh, promoting all of these different reform measures that will attract people to the conservatives. So they start promising, um, you know, more robust welfare programs for the needy and uh, not to be outdone. The liberals do the same thing. So, you know, that that is also a major part of what we see with politics today. And that is um, politicians and political parties promising uh, everything, you know, the stars, if you vote and that stuff is expensive. And that might be part of the reason why we have a $23 trillion uh, uh, deficit, uh, debt in this country. But anyway, I digress. Moving on. Uh, another thing, people's budget. This was just legisla uh, legislation uh, about um, exactly those social welfare programs. So Great Britain sort of moves away from laissez-faire economics and starts to embrace this form of uh, belief that the government does have a responsibility to provide for the needs of its citizens. So that that is... Um, something that is uh, noteworthy, okay? The House of uh, Lords no longer has political power uh, during this time period as well. They're stripped of it uh, because these are the people who are landed, you know, uh, aristocracy, and they used to have 
in influence and input and by 1911 since they're not elected they 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 they, uh, they don't have a say okay the one issue that they have to deal with um, the British is the the Irish okay so if we go back to 1801 with the Act of Union that's when they get Scotland England and uh, Ireland all combined to be known as the United Kingdom um, the Irish and the English have bad blood um, it goes all the way back to uh, Oliver Cromwell trying to uh, uh, commit genocide against the uh, the Irish but um, also the uh, Irish potato famine we really see the mistreatment of the Irish by the uh, uh, English landlords and so as far as the Irish are concerned they're very nationalistic in that they don't want anything to do with the British they want the British or the English out of Ireland and they want self-governance and that I mean there's certainly uh, one can understand uh, why they they would want that uh, so the, the what the English do and what they've sort of traditionally done is they've taken a slow road approach uh, you know like little instrumental changes along the way so the Irish are going to get what they want eventually but it's going to take a long time all right so in 1829 they get Catholic Emancipation Act which allows Irish Catholics to vote and hold political office because remember Great Britain and they've had a long history of you know problems with Catholics and not wanting Catholics on the throne etc cetera, etc cetera. so this was sort of a big thing but that doesn't mean that the Irish weren't still mistreated because they were uh, and that gives rise after the uh, the Irish potato famine it gives rise to this radical group known as the Fenian Brotherhood whose goal was to uh, bring about self-rule like to app or well actually to gain complete and, and total sovereignty and independence from uh, Great Britain okay and they're going to use radical uh, terroristic uh, uh, methods to do that okay so that doesn't sit well with the majority of either country's population um, later on sometime later in 1870s this guy named Charles Parnell an Irish uh, politician has a more middle of the road approach and that is to gain um, sort of their own parliament but still remain part of Great Britain and that becomes known as home rule and it's not until um, World War one hitting that they uh, uh, gain that so it's going to take a long time before they achieve that uh, so want to talk about Russia for a moment um, and that is the assassination of uh, Alexander II so the last time that we talked about uh, Russia in depth was what happened to them following their defeat in the Crimean War uh, the Crimean War exposed how um, uh, uh, that they weren't industrialized and so the response was they needed to modernize they needed to free the emancipate the serfs and bring about all of this reform and alexander ii does all of these things but he is assassinated okay and so his son his heir to the throne alexander iii kind of sees all the things that his father did uh to try to reform the country but yet he was still assassinated felt like he shouldn't continue on that road to reform but instead go the opposite direction and repress 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 now we've seen this happen in other parts of Europe you know centuries prior but Russia is sort of you know they're, they're, they're backwards they're sort of behind the times so they're going to go through that uh, uh, as well where they try to tamp down the calls for reform and we're going to see that it's not going to work uh, ultimately but he uses uh, repressive measures secret police political prisons stuff we've all seen before okay um one of the other things that he does is uh this russification and because if you look at and see just how vast and how large this is uh for you kennedy this is russia um <laughs> you can see how big russia is there's a lot of different ethnic groups and a lot of these ethnic groups want their self-rule all right um 
And so the way that he deals with this is attempts to tamp it down and repress it and passes a Russification program where everybody has to speak the same language and they all have to worship the same religion. They got to speak Russian and they got to worship Eastern Orthodox or Russian Orthodox. And um, that's, you know, what the way he deals with it. And uh, there is a large minority group known as you know, Jews. And um, because they had an involvement, some Jews had an involvement in the assassination of his father, he sort of scapegoats them and tries uh, to drive him out of the country. And he uh, supports a pogrom, which is state-sponsored violence against a group of people. And it was really bad. And over a million people uh, fled Russia, many of them ending up in the United States. This is all during like the 1880s. Um, all right, so when he dies, he's succeeded by his son, Nicholas II. And the thing we need to know about Nicholas that is that he's basically a carbon copy of his father. He's going to follow his father's footsteps of being a very autocratic or authoritarian leader and, you know, have secret police and, and uh, political prisons, uh, etc. So um, the, 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 the one thing that, you know, is happening during all of this time is an attempt to, to modernize their economy, and they do so. Um, but the Russians sort of, Nicholas makes a blunder because he thinks that um, they're, they're more industrialized and more powerful, I guess, than, than they really were. Um, as the rest of Europe at this time is um, taking over a lot of different territories throughout the world, especially in, Af um, in Africa, um, countries like Great Britain and France especially, Russia is sort of eyeing its territory uh, to the east. And so they start uh, annexing territory in Manchuria that belonged to China. And then they start eyeing this territory this is korea but this is going to bring them into direct conflict with the japanese um, and the japanese as recently as 1860s uh 1867 began modernizing itself sort of modeling itself after uh, european countries like germany uh, great britain and then also the united states to bring industrialization there and they were quite successful and they built the first rate military well russia does not think that japan needs to be um, negotiated with and so they looked at annex korea and that's what japan was trying to annex and so the japanese attacked them and defeat them in what is known as the russo-japanese war so this is a humiliating defeat for russia especially nicholas ii and this touches off a bunch of um, protests. There's all different kinds of groups who, you know, uh, the, the the industrial workers of the cities, they want better conditions. Uh, the minority groups, the ethnic minority groups want independence. Uh, liberals want, you know, a constitutional monarchy. So there's all of these groups who are uh, calling for, you know, reform and change. And so 200,000 people uh, converge on the, uh, the the Tsar's Winter Palace, the capital, uh, in St. Petersburg, and they stage a peaceful protest. Well, Nicholas leaves and instructs his soldiers to disperse the crowd, and, and even though it was a peaceful crowd, they fired into it, killing 500 to 1,000 people or wounding that many, and that triggered the Revolution of 1905. So there was an uprising in, in Moscow and in St. Petersburg, one that look that it was going to engulf the whole country so what nicholas ii does to prevent that from happening he wisely um agrees to um a bunch of uh reforms and the biggest of which was a a legislative body known as the duma uh, modeled sort of after parliament uh, and they want a new constitution, and they want to take Russia the direction of Great Britain and make it a limited constitutional monarchy. When things quiet down, Nicholas II basically decides he doesn't want to share power, and he dismisses the Duma and tries to you know, repress and arrest people and send people to Siberia if they, they speak out. And so he's able to kind of hold on to power uh, for a while. But, um, you know, he, he continues to push, down, push through some 
some reforms, some of which, you know, are successful, but mostly not. Um, the other topic that's noteworthy is the, and I, I was kind of speaking to it, was nationalism. But nationalism, as we've defined it up until this point, has sort of been a force for good because it has led to the unification of Italy and then Germany. But um, it's going to take on a uh, um, an edge that is um, a little malevolent, and and that is its linkage to racism. This idea that if you're not us, you're them, and if you're them, you're you're something's wrong with you. And so this is going to lead to a lot of discrimination. Um, against groups and uh, the group that's going to suffer the most are going to be the Jews. Uh, and so anti-Semitism in the late 1800s, not just in Russia, but in other parts, really becomes a common theme as we saw with um, the uh, Dreyfus affair as well. Um, but it wasn't just um, Jews, it was people of other races. So uh, Asians and African people of you know Asian or African descent they were seen as inferior and there was an attempt to kind of make some scientific uh, I guess links which proved you know unsuccessful but this idea that you know with Charles Darwin and the survival of the fittest they tried to apply that to um, people as well um, one of the things that's noteworthy, and I kind of already mentioned it, was the, the pogroms that swept through Russia created a movement of Europe's Jews, but especially the Russian Jews, to get the heck out of Europe. They've had several centuries of anti-Semitism. Why not go back to Jerusalem, where their original homeland is? And so that triggers something known as the Zionist movement, or Zionism, and that is a desire to create a Jewish homeland in the Holy Land, Palestine, or the land in and around Jerusalem. So it's in the Middle East. The problem is Arabs and Muslim Arabs inhabit that land. And so, you know, for them to establish their old homeland or reestablish their old home homeland would require displacing those Arab Muslims who, who occupy it now. So that that Zionist movement is going to, you know, bear fruit eventually after World War I. Um, Jews will begin migrating to that area and the British are going to help see to it. But this is where the idea is hatched, Zionism. And Theodore Herzl is the man who is responsible for that. All right. A couple more topics here. The Socialist International was just a uh, an attempt led by Karl Marx to sort of unify all of the uh, the world socialists because in his book um, the Communist Manifesto he he you know predicted a worldwide revolution and so the idea was to try to help foster that um, but the Socialist International pretty much died out but uh, but still the uh, socialists remained until after World War one a um, a pretty important and powerful um, political uh, party in, in most European countries. The last topic here is the feminist movement. And um, the, the feminist movement is associated with women uh, ascertaining uh, political equality with that of men and uh, being able to have the same educational and uh, uh, professional opportunities as men. So it's really three issues. They want political equality. Uh, that means to be able to vote and hold property uh, and sue and in court, uh, but also to uh, gain entrance to any university and also to not be barred from being a doctor, uh, a lawyer, etc. Okay, so that was really the, the goal. Um, and remember all the way back from Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the, the overriding sort of philosophy was this idea of separate spheres. The woman is to be given special consideration of the home. She is the natural nurturer. She gives birth to children. She's the mother. So that should be her domain, but everything else should be left to men. They obviously didn't like that. 
and uh, what we're going to see is, you know, uh, a divide within the women. All right. So there's, there's, what do they want? You know, do they want the right to vote? Do they want uh, educational rights? So the 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 first and foremost um, goal is to get the right to vote because if they get the right to vote, then they can, um, if they achieve political equality, then they can they they could look to change those other things like educational and uh, economic opportunities. But there were two different groups. There were the suffragists and the suffragettes. Okay, so the suffragists were women who worked peacefully for the for the vote in a more dignified way. But the suffragettes were led were primarily in Great Britain, and they were led by a woman by the name of Emmeline Pankhurst. And her group was seen as more radical because they would um, do things that would be considered unladylike. And I don't want to necessarily say violent, but... Uh, certainly things that we hadn't seen historically women do. Um, women were considered more prim and proper, and some of the things that the women were doing was much more aggressive. Uh, and uh, so their tactics um, were not widely accepted. Uh, they were very controversial, and there was a lot of pushback from society, and the police, um, you know, dealt with them pretty roughly. Uh, <clears throat> some women, suffragettes, went on hunger strikes where they had to be force fed. And here down here is a picture of a woman uh, who, who walked out in front of a horse race. Uh, she was a suffragette and, she, and I think the, the, the queen was uh, in, in audience. And so she basically sacrificed her life and walked right out in the middle and got trampled by a horse and killed uh, all for the cause. And so some people you know, they had different reactions. Some people were horrified. Some people thought that that was brave. So um, eventually after World War One, women get the right to vote. Uh, and so people are like, who, who, who had more influence? Was it the suffragists in their more moderate approach or the suffragettes in their more radical approach? Both probably had influence, but there's something else to consider too. And that is the role that women played during World War One. They responded to the call to fill all the industrial jobs that had been vacated by men so that the countries could still provide their uh, militaries with the, the types of supplies and ammunition and weapons that they needed. And that would not have been possible had not women uh, stepped up and, and, you know, done their patriotic duty. And so Another reason why women gained the right to vote was because countries sort of as payoff or as a, a, a you know, a token of their gratitude granted women the right to vote after World War I. So I apologize for the lengthy nature of this, but there you have it. Thank you for watching.